The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, I'll go ahead and get started if everyone's okay with that. So somebody will let me know when to start. All right. So uh, first and foremost, thank you all for uh, sticking with the conference to the very last hours of it. Uh, somehow or another, this happens to me more than I care to more than I care to uh, remember. So I should start indicating that I have a time commitment during the last session. So I say, stop sticking me there. Um, but thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about open source software in the classroom. Okay. And as you can see, my Twitter handle is I share our comics. But people, whenever they interact with me in the real world, refer to me as Barry Petticord III. Um, so my background will hopefully help provide some context for what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I'm a PhD student at North Carolina State University in Raleigh. Uh, my research is in computer science education. Um, specifically, I'm interested in looking at how people um, acquire and then use programming languages. So as you can imagine, that's very useful to people who teach uh, technology. And in doing so, I ended up uh, becoming a teacher. Um, you know, when you're in grad school, it's not free, and they, uh, you know, they pull you around to teaching to help you pay your own tuition. Um, so I've been teaching for about two years. Um, I started off teaching a, uh, a junior level software engineering course where we teach you know, agile software development methodology. And then um, this most recently, or last year, uh, I taught uh, C and software tools, so the C programming language, and all the glory of pointers, uh, hardware, memory management, that sort of thing. Um, I have a very diverse background, both in education and in open source. Yes? Can I ask what level your C class is that you teach at towards freshman? It's, it's a sophomore level class. Oh. Yeah, feel free to interrupt with questions anytime. I'm a lot more animated when I'm answering questions. The question was, what level is it? Um, from a master's degree, I did cybersecurity research. Um, hacked cell phones, uh, did network analysis. It was pretty fun stuff. Um, and then uh, I've even you know, done a little bit of open source. Uh, the software I made for my master's research is open source on GitHub and was uh, received very well at the, um, the Large Installation System Administration Conference, LISA, back in 2012. Um, I've also provided patches for uh, an entire two uh, open source computer games. Um, so I have a little bit of experience in that world. But mostly my experience in open source came from uh, you know, discovering Linux, discovering you know, the GPL in my freshman year. And while most college students go under some sort of you know, uh, socialist uh, awakening, uh, mine was um, an open source awakening. So, uh, but, but deep down, I love education. I love teaching, uh, I love teaching people things. And I've had to reconcile um, you know, what I've learned and loved about the open source community with my responsibilities as an instructor. So, um, the goal of this presentation, if you can't see the slides, don't worry, they're not important, they're for me, not for you. Um, introduction, which we've just covered. Um, I'm going to be talking about, uh, first of all, you know, the technical part, the, the fun technical part that hopefully, you know, the developers in the room can appreciate where I created my own auto grading system because the objective of computer science is we're lazy we don't want to do anything more than once. If we do it more than once, it's better to write a program instead of doing it twice. Um, but then I'm going to go into the real meat of the presentation, which is combining the, um, the, technical, the technical guts with the educational philosophies of it, the, the parts of good pedagogy um, that mesh well with the uh, open source, um, the fun open source hacky parts. And then finally, some lessons I've learned um, you know, as a you know, starting out teacher, as a young developer, uh, going his way into uh, you know, academia. So hopefully you will find some interest in this. Um, I don't expect this will take the entire hour, but I'm always more than happy to entertain a, a lively discussion. And since we have so few people here, that just makes the discussion more, uh, more personal, right? So let's start with a story. Um, as you know, like I said, I'm a computer scientist. My bachelor was in computer science, master's in computer science, currently pursuing a PhD in computer science. I, I love programming, I love computers, I love technology. Um, and I love using technology to make my life easier. Uh, in middle school, my first program was on the TI-83 Plus calculator, where I, uh, you know, 
took all the formulas from class, put them all on my calculator. Uh, not only was I using them on the homework and the, on the examinations, uh, I was able to fix a problem with the instructor's answer key because I simply had my program uh, handy and ready. So from that moment forward, I realized that computers would do me a lot of good and programming would be very productive in my life. Um, so fast forward a little while, going to uh, college, particularly grad school, um, I realized something, that I love teaching. Teaching is wonderful. Teaching is exciting. You get you know, to meet lots of people and uh, you get to talk in front of a lot of people every day. Um, the five minutes before class starts is very awkward, as you saw before this presentation began. But once I get into it, I, you know, I really, have, really do love what I'm doing. What I don't love is grading. Grading is painful. I hate grading so much. It's the worst thing in the world. Uh, it has to be done. It has to be done because students are there to get a degree, and without grades, they won't get one. So they won't like you very much if you don't give them grades. Um, and here's the thing about programming. Programming is on computers. And I'm, I'm also good at programming computers. Uh, there should be some way to grade these things automatically, right? There should be some way to take computer student source code and then find some way to automatically assign a grade to them that requires very little human intervention, right? Especially the ones who do everything right. If they get, if they get all their assignment right, they're going to you know, pass all their tests. They're not going to have any bugs because it compiles, it runs, it's going to get the right output. They should get a 100 and I shouldn't have to look at it because I don't need to spend my time with students who know what they're doing. My, my time needs to be spent with students who actually need my help, right? So I decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make myself an autograder. But I couldn't just make an autograder, okay? Because A, I, I wasn't going to program one myself because I don't have that kind of time. I have to graduate too. Um, so what I did was I was looking at some tools that I used myself when I was a student, and I realized, hey, there's a thing called Jenkins. Continu Anyone here who knows, knows what Jenkins is? Only a few folks. So Jenkins is what's called a continuous integration tool. What you do is you host Jenkins on a server, Jenkins can monitor a subversion, a GitHub, a Mercurial repository. And every time it sees a change, it will pull a change, run it against your testing suite, and then tell the user with a little happy face or a well, blue circle or a red circle if it succeeded or failed. Well, you know what? That actually works really well for creating programming, wouldn't you say? So what I did was I set it up, set up a Jenkins server, made one repository for every student in my class, Told them all how to upload code to the repository. It's a, we, we use GitHub. Um, we, have a, uh, we pay for an enterprise installation of GitHub on our own servers. Um, we use GitHub. They submit their code to their GitHub repository. Jenkins periodically pulls it and then tells them with a blue circle or a red circle whether or not it passed the teacher's test cases. OK? Not only does it take care of that grading for me, which I used to do manually. I used to you know, write a bash script that would iterate over every single student file, which I downloaded from Moodle, which nobody named correctly, by the way. I iterated through all the folders after normalizing them, ran them against my script of tests. And then I had to manually go through and read the tests to make sure they were all passing. Okay, So that was a pain, because I have 80 students. I've got, I've got very little students, by the way. If you're at Berkeley or something, they, they brag about having 800 students. So I have 80. I'm very lucky. Jenkins does that for me. Not only does it do it for me, though, it tells the student how they're doing. The one thing that I hated as a student was I would submit my work to a, a locker on Moodle or whatever the course management software is. I'd submit my, my, my code there, and then, like, five minutes before the deadline, I'd go, oh, God, does it actually compile? Did I make a stupid mistake in submitting it? Will it run the teacher's hardware? That's, like, the worst feeling in the world. You know what's really cool about Jenkins? If it didn't work, you get a red circle. If it worked, you got a blue circle. If you got a blue circle and it was working, you're done. You're done. You've got a 100. You're done. Don't, don't worry about it anymore. So not only that, we were able to solve that problem, too. Students weren't freaking out about whether it would run on our system. They could see exactly what they were going to get before the deadline. So my, my hope was, you know, students would start submitting work earlier. By the way, that didn't happen. They still all submitted it right before the deadline. But, you know, it, it felt good when I was planning it. So the entire flow works like this. As an instructor, what I would do is I have to make my homework assignment. Now, making all those GitHub repositories is not easy, but luckily for us, GitHub has a beautiful API for creating repos. So I just write up a Python script to do that. Some very simple parameters, number of the homework assignment, you know, what kind of files I expect the student to use, kind of our template. We populate all their repos with it. And then we set up uh, the jobs on Jenkins. We start the homework assignment. We tell them what the requirements are. Students start submitting their code on J uh, Jenkins. They don't start immediately. They start you know, a, a day before it's due. Jenkins will pull their changes 
and continue to send them their responses while they do the work. See, another problem is students don't do work at like, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon. They do work at three o'clock in the morning and they, I can't respond to their emails at that time. So while I'm asleep, Jenkins is telling them how they're doing. You know, so they, they, they get some assistance. And then ultimately the final goal is I get less emails and everybody's happier, right? So that's the setup. I mean, it, it, it's, not, it's not super, super fancy, but I was, I was very proud of it. The rest of the department was very happy with it. Um, this summer, we're teaching summer school. I'm no longer, I'm not teaching right now. I'm doing full-time research, but my, my teaching mentor now is using that software to teach her uh, summer, summer class, which is really, really makes me feel good. Uh, we can all appreciate a good hack, right? We, or, I mean, this isn't even, this is kind of a hack. It's still very hacky because it's not documented. Um, but we can still appreciate the technical merit behind it. But there's more to it than that. There's more to it than the, than the fun, technical, solve a problem using a program approach. And that's sort of what I'm going to, you know, get into. So before I move on, are there any questions about the technical thing I made? Does anyone here not have any idea what I mean when I say Jenkins polls GitHub and gives students their answers? Yo. So Jenkins, did Jenkins give any points for programming style? Does Jenkins give any points for programming style? Like, if some student does something good, this runs and this is the correct answer, but it's really bad. <laughs> Uh, Jenkins doesn't, but we've been, you know, adding new software to it as time goes along. There's a wonderful tool called Vera, V-E-R-A, which does style checking of C and C++ code. We integrated that into Jenkins and implemented some style rules. It's a little bit um, obsessive. We'll just use that word. We'll say it's obsessive about the uh, exact style. But the cool thing is we give the student line by line what's wrong with each line of style and the student can fix it. Only thing it doesn't grade is documentation, but, you know, the, the odds are if there are less students who fit that profile of getting it right and having bad style than students who have bad style and just get it wrong anyway. So, you know, that's, that, that's a population that's a, minor, that's a substantial minority and we don't really, really worry about them. So whenever I'm teaching or whenever I'm developing anything in an educational context, I have to ask, Three, uh, three questions. The first one is, what are the learning objectives or outcomes of the course I'm developing the solution for? Okay? As a Linux open source user, I would love very much to brainwash all my students into believing my ways of doing things the right way. Right? So I would love to see everyone using GitHub just for the sake of using GitHub or, you know, using, you know, the proper brace indentation style just because I believe that's right. But that's right there is not the learning objective. Every course has a set of prescribed learning outcomes, written kind of like an IETF RFC. At the end of this course, the student shall, in all capital letters, shall be able to write programs in C. Students shall be able to write and test a, you know, write, write a unit test, and so on and so forth. So the first place I always look is at those lists of shalls. Um, and as it turns out, there are two shalls that work really well with this. The first one is that they have to use version control at some in some capacity. So, hey, awesome, GitHub's version control, let's use that now. So it fits in with the learning objectives. Students also, the, we, the, the full name of my course is C and Software Tools, which is really, really flexible. So I can take any tool used in software and include in the course and have no student tell me the course isn't supposed to be about that. So Jenkins fits in well with the fact that students will learn how to use tools that professionals use to improve their software, whether it's you know, version control, or whether it's continuous integration, uh, testing, testing harness builders, whatever. So I have to make sure that my, um, my solutions map to the learning objectives. And the reason for that is because the learning objectives are very carefully made to avoid um, overwhelming students. You don't want to teach them, you know, you don't want to try and cram too many things into the already cram-packed schedule. You don't want to teach them things that require a whole lot of prerequisite knowledge. Okay? For example, I might believe that Python's better than C, but I cannot put Python in this course and get away with it. But then there's the second part, which is the needs of the rest of the curriculum. What I mean when I say that is, when they leave my class, what are they going to be prepared to do in their next class? I had the very wonderful advantage of teaching the immediate class that fo follows mine before I taught the class I taught last year. Okay? I taught the junior level before I taught the sophomore level so I could prepare my sophomores for the junior level. 
It turns out that in that class, you have to use version control. You have to use continuous integration. So I figure, well, if we just introduce it to them a little bit earlier, they'll be way better off when they get to that class next time. How does your solution prepare students for the rest of the curriculum? Okay, every class in itself is not a, not a little vacuum. You don't just, hopefully, you don't just put everything down and start anew with something new. Hopefully, it builds on the previous stuff. Because when it does build on the previous stuff, when students see what's happening from one class to the next, they take it very seriously. They really do. Because they know that their success, in the end, is being you know, predicated on what you're doing right now. So that's, uh, that's a good thing to know. And then finally, what are the needs outside of the class? When they graduate, when they go into the real world, how does what you're doing prepare them for that? I also believe that you know, knowing how to design a Turing machine by hand is very, very useful. I'm not going to get away with teaching that in my class, particularly because that's not something most people do in the real world. Who here has ever designed a Turing machine at their job? I did not think so. Um, but who here has used version control at their job? Anyone here use continuous integration? Jenkins, Travis, anything? We have, should we, be. Should be. <laughs> we have a smaller crowd here, so you know, the, uh, the numbers are interesting. Um, but what's really cool is how students do in fact latch onto it whenever you show them that the tools you're doing are done in practice. And there's two reasons for this. The first is, um, has anyone here heard of WebCat? WebCat is an educational tool that does unit testing for, for, for um, students taking Java classes. It's made by Virginia Tech. You upload your unit test there, and all the students upload their code. And then it tells all the students how they're doing. Kind of like Jenkins does. It's kind of like continuous integration, except it's only for teaching. WebCat tells the students how, how they do, and they also give the teacher you know, a summary of student progress and who might need some extra help. Students hate WebCat. They despise it. They, they, they really hate it. Um, but students do not hate Jenkins, despite us using Jenkins for the exact same purpose of WebCat and being less user friendly. Because Jenkins was real. Jenkins was a real tool. Because if you have a problem with Jenkins, you type it in Google, you get all these mailing lists that uh, you know, will have your exact error message on that mailing list and the eight clones that appear. You know, those ridiculous websites that collect uh, mailing lists and archive them for Google to find them. So real developers are using these tools. And because real, developers are using these, because real developers are using these tools, there's lots of resources for students who need, need the extra help. You know, there are tutorials, a lot of tutorials. There are you know, messages to email lists. And ultimately, it kind of leads to one of the most important goals I try to get every of my students to learn, which is Google it before you ask me. Google your error messages. Because that's what your job's going to be doing. Your job's going to be doing that a lot. Giving students tools that aren't made by teachers who keep them for themselves and share them with their friends, using tools that developers use, they're very open about when they don't, they don't work. Because you'll see angry blog posts about them. You'll see angry emails about them. They will get, hopefully they'll get fixed. But even if they don't, someone hopefully has a workaround for it, and that'll help your students out. Hopefully, I'll come back and see my students in a couple of years, and they will tell me that they've picked that up. Hopefully. And then finally, we ask, you know, what have I learned when I've been you know, in this teaching capacity? What have I learned from this you know, teaching job? Um, The first thing always to do is check the syllabus. The syllabus is your Bible for the course. Everything that matters, uh, all the desired outcomes that the, uh, you know, the students need to get when they, when they uh, depart your course. And then the second is to not introduce too much information at once. Okay? Students get overwhelmed very easily. One, because they don't read instructions. Um, but making sure that you, you, you introduce tools um, at an acceptable rate where they can process each one and feel like they understand what's going on. They can feel like they're in control of each one. You want to make sure they get to master each tool before you introduce them to another one. 
case in point, uh, for the junior level software engineering class. We make students do all of their work on Eclipse. Um, we make them do, uh, they, we teach them data databases for the first time, so they're using JDBC, Java Database Connector. Yeah, Java Database Connector. Um, they have to do JSP for the first time, so they're making a, an interactive live website that has to set up Tomcat for the first time. The whole first week of class is, here are all the tools, learn them all before week two. Um, most students still don't know how to set up half the tools before week four. It's overwhelming. But by my goal with my, my tool was, well, let's take some of those tools, teach them at the class right before it. That way, at least they've mastered a few of them. So they'll be reviewed when they get to the junior level. And then most teachers who are already, already have their jobs, they're not interested in anything that's gonna make their lives harder. Okay, me, I'm, I'm a grad student, I'm trying to impress people. I wanna get a job when I graduate. So I'm always happy to go forth, do the extra unpaid labor and make a cool auto grading tool. But if it doesn't make the, uh, it does, if it doesn't make the incumbent's job easier, they don't want anything to do with it because then it's something else they have to learn. Furthermore, if it doesn't improve learning, if it actually gets in the way of learning, it's not worth doing in the first place. There are some caveats to that, but. For the most part, my tool did both because students reflected very positively in their course evaluations. They really appreciated being able to work with this Jenkins tool because they liked the feedback. They had you know, instant feedback uh, for what they were working on. Um, and they appreciated the ability to do you know, some work with real tools. And one of the most important things, the most important things was they had the opportunity to use version control before working in a team. Before this experiment, you introduced version control for the team assignment and you never used it for any individual assignments. Can anyone see any problems with that? The biggest problem with that is that team assignments are super high pressure and very emotional. It's bad enough they have to do the project, but to throw in extra software they have to learn together while they're doing it, that is a recipe for disaster. So what they do is because they're using GitHub to submit their homework to me, they've used it for three whole projects before they do the team assignment. They still have to work together, that's still gonna be very painful, but it's not the fault of Git, hopefully, because they probably already had a merge conflict by then. So that's about, that's the prepared content for today. You know, it's very lightweight, it's very simple. I made a tool, I connected it with my, with my key uh, priorities of the teacher. I deployed it and it was successful. Most of the time it's not successful, this time it was, I was very lucky. Um, but are there any other, uh, any other questions or any other like detailed topics about open source and education that they'd like uh, some insight on? Go for it. Do you see Jenkins being able to grade more things than programming uh, The question was, do I see Jenkins being able to grade more things than programming assignments? Um, when you say more things, uh, that could be, you know, several different things. So the, the nice thing about Jenkins is that it works well because the way Jenkins works is you simply write a bash script and it will run it on everything it sees. That was appropriate for my use case because that's how I graded in the first place. It was just a matter of taking that uh, bash script. Um, in essence, anything that could be graded automatically could be done on Jenkins because what you, all you have to do is write up your script. Let's say I'm grading algebra, okay? And I come up with some sort of way that students can type up a, a set of algebra steps in a text file. They can submit it, and if I can like write a Python script that can parse that, and then either return a success exit code or a fail exit code back up to the Jenkins process, it will give you the blue or red dot. The advantage of Jenkins, of course, is that you get to deploy it on a wide scale. You could even personalize it for every student if you build that into your script. Um, and the uh, other, other beautiful key thing is that um, Jenkins keeps track of all the failures and successes. So you get to see you know, how students are doing over time. Do they flounder and just fail and fail and fail trying random things? Or do you see a, a gradual progression towards finally getting the, getting the point? So um, Jenkins is an automation tool that works well when you have a, it works well over a, lar a large set of repositories. So if you can classify your assignment into that, then yeah, it will work. 
does the system with Jenkins have a possibility to um, communicate back to the student maybe uh, what may be wrong with their code that they submitted, what area they need to focus to, um, to correct it? So the way that um, we coded ours was we have a script that um, has a list of inputs and outputs. We do black box testing. We have a script with a list of inputs and outputs, and then by default, we just show them the Jenkins, we just show them the Jenkins log. Running test one, test one succeeds. Running test two, test two fails. You know, expected blah, got blah. Running test three, test three succeeds. Technically, I could, you know, and I did do this, I could add whatever um, extra output I want to just by echoing it to the console. So if a particular test fails, and I know that test is looking at a particular part of code, then I could provide a special message for that. Um, it's just a matter of, uh, it's really hard to anticipate all the errors students can make. Um, and in general, it's not even worth it because you're anticipating all the wrong ones. So not only do you do, do a bunch of work in advance, you do it for nothing. So that's the only downside to that. Um, but you can customize it to the extent that you can prepare for things and encode them into passing and failing responses. I can see where it's most ideal if you're using this for yes and no. Um, type of response or a multiple choice, but how would a student really get legitimate leverage, let's say for calculus problem, algebra, right, and you're doing steps, there's not going to be the option of partial credit. Um, and as mentioned before, as far as a program, the uniqueness, the, you know, something um, uh, as far as the method, which is more ideal, and might capture more um, possible, you know, pitfalls, et cetera. So there I don't see it where the student really is going to get the leverage if you're just worried about the final output. Uh, that's a great point, thank you. Um, so there's a couple of points I can raise to uh, address multiple parts of the question. One part of the question was on uh, partial credit. Um, yes, it's true that we only show them, a, we don't just, actually it's not true, we don't only show them the red or blue dot because we show them you know that log file and our rubric the one we give to our TAs is measured based on output of that log file so the students see exactly what our TAs are grading by so we show them the rubric we show them what matters what counts more what counts less so the student you know hopefully will develop the metacognition to go through and review that um, there has been some research which I didn't bring up uh, that um, giving students the rubric is very good because they can um, they can get a chance to think like the instructor and that encourages more critical insight into the way they're doing their assignments. So we give them that opportunity. And that's one thing I should have included on my reasons why I did stuff. Um, the step-by-step -step part is absolutely more difficult. The, the, the progression is very important. Um, for example, uh, I was just reading a paper today um, on the fact that uh, uh, that was trying to divide up the parts of computational thinking. Um, some elements are very you know, isolated, like can people do loops? Can people do repetition? And you can see that by simply looking at their code. Other elements require you to see things longitudinally. You need to see the way that they're changing. Does a student run a program, test it, see it fail, and then fix it? And you're right, it's very hard to do that when all you're doing is you know, checking, did they break the build, build or not? Um, my current technology does not help with that. And I cannot imagine technology that will do it for you. The only thing that we can do at that point is get a, uh, you know, get a human grader to go in and spend the extra effort. But you also have to keep in mind, is the time you're spending on that fine-grained tutoring, is it cost-effective? From, from your standpoint, I can understand that. But from a student who wants to keep their GPA up and is working extremely hard, you know every point one manners. You're absolutely so right. I'm just saying in fairness, I see it from your perspective, I do Barry, and I think um, ultimately it is most ideal for multiple choice, yes, no, <laughs> but I am hoping that um, everyone who uses this approach and the outcome isn't correct, they go back and they, they give fairness to the student to look at that. That's it, yeah, you're right, that's, you're absolutely right, that's, that's extremely important. Um, and 
What's really great about this approach is it casts a really, the idea is to, these approaches, these automated approaches are very much biased for students who are already getting things right. What's really great about them is that it helps you um, more effectively use that little bit of time you have so that way you can prioritize the students who do need the extra help. You can actually, you can actually preemptively find these students who may not be asking for help and may, may just be waiting for you know, the instructors you know, to ask them, how are you doing? You know? What's really great about this is that the binary classification right or wrong, it does hide, it, 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 it hides a lot, but sometimes it can raise the attention of the students who do need extra help that you can help them with that one-on-one -on -one tutoring that they absolutely need to ensure their personal success. By freeing up instructor time, we can more, we can more effectively help the students who need it most. Hopefully, hopefully that helps. I'm, you know, hopefully that. Okay. I see that um, you said they started using it the next semester with someone else using it. Mm -hmm. uh, what it sounds like is it worked. It saved time. The students got into it we're going to make it part of the curriculum how do we get this knowledge on a broad scheme get other universities doing the same thing or other departments or other how do we make it spread um so what my advisor wants to do is turn it into an open source project managed by the university and you know managed in the sense that we host it um in general uh, most most universities will prefer to use something prepackaged that is plug and play. So the way you get to spread is you make this plug and play thing work, and you talk about a lot of conferences, and then the other school will, you know, other enterprising teachers will start using it, and you know, it snowballs from there. Um, you know, basically, lots of the advertising from the academic circles is word of mouth. So if there's a really cool tool that you like, first personally find a teacher who's going to like it, and then they'll start talking about it on their mailing list. And that's how a lot of it spreads. One last comment. You might want to look at um, Rational Team Concert if you're doing some type of open source, because that incorporates that whole concept of Hudson slash Jenkins. It includes like an instant messaging, so the students could be part of this collaboration within the group, et cetera. But it's a more elaborate, of course, corporate um, commercial product, but it has excellent uh, additional features that might be helpful. Uh, that's really cool. You said... Um, uh, it's called RTC for short, but Rational Team Concert. Rational Team Concert. Okay, that's really cool. Um, another thing that's important to know about schools is that they are not averse to, uh, universities are not averse to spending money on solutions that look like they can have success in multiple classes. Um, sure, a really nice solution is the grad student who does it for free in his spare time. Um, but if they want, if you know, if they, it, if you get a few teachers within the university to bring it up at the faculty meeting, um, oftentimes they will be happy to uh, pay for the educational licenses of, very, of various professional pieces of software. Yeah, it's definitely um, worth looking at, and it incorporates Rational Developer, um, RDZ. Okay. It's absolutely fabulous, very um, strong developing tool as well. So you can see the diffs right side by side. You can diff different versions. You can see who made uh, changes. I mean, it's just worth you looking into. Yeah, that sounds spectacular. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Other curiosities? Uh, when you say how so how successful has this tool been proven? Or um, I only used it one semester, so this is brand new. Um, I developed it to uh, address, like I said, the, the shortcomings of the gap between this class and the following one. Um, so I developed this as a stopgap measure. We won't know that, but my advisor would like to see some formal studies published, uh, working on this tool so we can publish it, because 
once again, a university will make a tool, they will test it on their own students, and they'll publish a paper, and you'll get a couple other users to buy into it. That's how WebCat got started. It was born out of Virginia Tech, and now lots of computer science programs are using it. But um, yeah, that's, that's still to be done. Well, if there aren't any other questions, I would just like to say that whenever you see an RFP or a request for, a request for proposals, go ahead and do it, because that's what I did. I just respond to all of them, and that's how I end up talking at these conferences. So you never know if they'll accept you. You don't have to worry about if it's interesting or not until after they let you in. So uh, thank you all for your attention. I hope that this was insightful. Uh, I'll still be around for a little bit longer if you'd like to talk to me offline. But uh, thank you all so much for uh, Thank you all so much. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.